Hello, friends. This is the ATC Double Cut, and in today's episode, I am pleased to have Dr. Doug Soldat from the University of Wisconsin joining us to talk about a beautiful photo that he shared of snow mold on bent grass. And you've you've shared this kind of photo, Doug, since at least 2014, maybe a little bit earlier. Can you can you tell us what happened? Isn't you're in Madison, Wisconsin? Yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. This morning it is uh, minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, we're, we're cold. <laughs> we're in the north. Um, this trial it's been running for 12 years now. My goal in establishing it was to understand what potassium deficiency symptoms looked like in the field and, and investigate um, soil and tissue levels where we saw those symptoms occurring. I did a very similar trial in the exact same putting green with phosphorus, and it only took about three years for that to happen. So once we wrapped up the phosphorus experiment, we moved on to potassium. And then, you know, at year three, okay, still nothing. Year five, nothing. Um, and in fact, the only thing we would see is that in the spring, and so when we do trials like this, we usually keep fungicides and disease control to a minimum because we're interested to see what happens. And if the disease gets really bad, then we'll control for it. But we're always just looking for things to go wrong. Um, so the only thing we'd see would be that on, on plots that had received potassium fertilization, the snow mold, the microdokium patch was always a little bit or sometimes a lot worse than the control plots that didn't receive potassium and other than that uh nothing else so about 2014 i think you're right on the date there i would take a picture put it on twitter um it, it wasn't we definitely weren't the first people to uh, describe this phenomenon and then so you know this is kind of the only exciting thing that happens in this trial so uh, this <laughs> year we had we had low snow cover and it was january uh really really kind of a warm uh stretch and i so, wow, this is one of the biggest differences we've ever seen. And I took the picture and put it out there and then a really nice discussion followed on, on Twitter. Yeah. So I thought it's interesting that you uh, posted this picture on January 18th and you, the, the words that you used to describe it were stop me if you've heard this one before, because this is something that has just been very consistent. And uh, it's remarkable, even even though you kind of know it's going to happen by now, and and a lot of people would expect that this would happen, it still is striking to see the huge effect that a, a sim just the simple difference of adding potassium or not adding potassium has on uh, a particular disease on creeping bent grass. It is. Uh, this picture, it was actually, it was probably, I don't know, 40, 45 degrees uh, Fahrenheit that morning. I teach, uh, it, we have a turf grass apprenticeship program at the University of Wisconsin. I, I took this, I posted it, and then I brought my students out and and talked about potassium and disease. And this is, this, this comparison, this side by side is the clearest uh, mm -hmm. uh, difference. But uh, you know, we replicate this four times and we walked through all four replications and it, they were all like the no potassium plots were all basically clean. And the plots that had received uh, potassium fertilizer all had at least some degree of snow mold. Now this, the, the, the plot on the left, there was the worst one on the whole putting green. It's in a low lying area. Snow mold is, is worse in, in wetter now, uh, is parts this, of the soil. Are we looking at pink snow mold here is this microdokium yeah microdokium patch uh pink snow mold that's the that's the pathogen you're looking at and you're actually looking at two plots so the the left side there's a division down the middle but there's actually two plots there that um that had both received potassium fertilizer on the right you have two plots that didn't receive so there's actually you're looking at four plots there to okay um take up the middle but there's there's more data in there than you think yeah, so anybody who wants to see this, if, if you're listening to this as a podcast, and if you somehow haven't seen this photo, go to the show notes and you will find a direct link to this post where I put a link to Doug's tweet and I, I took a screenshot of it and put that picture there. And also, when you go to that post, if, if you um, 
if you haven't been to the Asian Turfgrass website to see that post, if you scroll down to the related posts, you'll see that I've written about this and reshared some of the photos that Doug has shared from previous years. And I give them titles like The Winter's Tale, Every Spring When the Snow Melts. One of my favorites was Spots of Excitement in a Boring Experiment, <laughs> because it really... <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that you do this, a boring experiment, just to, to try to look at what field symptoms of potassium deficiency look like, and they don't happen. And uh, then you get these spots of excitement, which are disease. And it, it's, yeah, it's counterintuitive. But by now, uh, it was 20 years ago in the spring of uh, 2003 that I noticed in my potassium uh, treated plots on, on L93 creeping bent grass was what I was working with. I noticed that where I'd applied potassium, there was more snow mold when the snow melted. And yeah, it's interesting. And I, I think one of the questions, Doug, that a lot of people have is why, right? They, they want to know what's, what's happening and why, why it is. I, I think that one's a little bit trickier to answer. Yeah, Frank, Frank Rossi and Dave Moody um, have a hypothesis uh, about this. Nobody knows for sure, but probably one of the most, uh, I guess, detailed explanations for it would be that plants do this thing uh, where they, potassium is, is in nature is, is one of the most limiting nutrients. So when a plant comes across potassium, it's a valuable resource and it takes it up. Um, some people call that luxury consumption, where the plant will actually take up more potassium than it needs to maximize its growth. And it stores that extra potassium in the vacuole for use later. Um, and so the, the Dave Moody, Frank Rossi hypothesis was that when plants do that, it has a positive charge and you need to have a negative charge to balance out that positive charge in the vacuole. And uh, the plant can do that with things like chloride and sulfate and these other sort of common anions. But when the plant takes up so much potassium, it actually uses sugars and a lot of carbohydrates can be negatively charged like citrate and malate. Mm -hmm. And so their hypothesis was that when the plant's putting these sugars in a vacuole, which is like a closet, it's a storage facility, they're, they're not be able to be used, that the plant might be less able to uh, maintain uh protection use those sugars to protect against the disease or whatever well, they, so they, uh, they go ahead um they actually measured that they right? measured it yeah mm -hmm. yeah they measured higher citrate and malate concentrations in the vacuole so <clears throat> um the question is though is that really the mechanism or is you know we we see that but it's harder to to make the uh the direct connection for the infection process but that's a good that's a good reason I think yeah, I, I I looked up uh, Dave Moody's dissertation, and uh, I I've got a quote. It's a diversion of carbon resources, um, and so is is that the cause or not? When you, they definitely measured that there's increased citrate and malate when you have uh, more potassium in the leaf, but th this was with Poa annua, right? But then. Correct. But then you're saying it's a, so that's, that's for sure. But then the hypothesis part is, is it the cause or not? And that one's a little bit trickier to know. Yeah, it could be something else entirely. It could be, it could be multiple things, right? That could be a component of it. It could be that um, the, the Microdochium nivale pathogen uh, grows faster with high levels of potassium. It, like yeah, it, like it that's could be... a component for that fungus. Like you're fertilizing the fungus or something. So, you know, there's a lot of things, nobody's really nailed it down. Um, but, you know, in turf management, there, we, we, we know fewer mechanisms than we don't know. You, like the, the normal, like we don't know much about dollar spot either. When, it, when you start d digging into the questions of why, you know, why mm -hmm. does nitrogen influence dollar spot? Why does uh, iron influence dollar spot? Uh, we don't know. We know very clearly that those things do, but we don't have the mechanisms pinned down yet. Yeah, it's... It's, it's interesting. So then, uh, should we, let, let's see what, why? Oh, here, here's a good one. Why are you not seeing potassium deficiency after f how many years, 12 years you've done this now? Yeah. So, yeah. So 12 years. So for this uh, particular <clears throat> site, 
not like everybody's not going to some places will see a potassium deficiency in one year, two years, three years. You haven't seen it in 12 years and you may never see it. And can you explain why that is? Yeah. Yeah. We, again, this is a boring experiment. We do, we have a lot of experiments that we just, uh, Hey, it's, it's may we do this thing and we don't really think about the data, what we're seeing in this one, they just see nothing. So you just keep doing it. And I think about like year seven, eight, we're like, hold on a second, let's do some math here. We've removed, or we calculate the amount of potassium that we removed in the turf grass clippings. <clears throat> and then we looked at the soil test potassium in the control plots, and, and we found that, th that we should be seeing potassium deficiency like right away. Like the we're removing more potassium than is in the Malik 3 exchangeable root zone. Mm -hmm. So we're like, oh, this is really weird. Um, and then we we did some research uh, literature searching and found other people before, like you always find there's always people that uh, do things before you in science and uh, exchangeable potassium that you measure with the malic three is not the only source of potassium and and many soil minerals feldspars and and others contain relatively high amounts of potassium as part of their physical structure and so what what we think we're, we're convinced is happening is that the bent grass is able to dissolve the minerals in the sand to get the potassium it needs. And then uh, eventually that would be depleted, but we top dress. So we're adding new minerals every, every year, every month, and we're actually adding more in top dressing sand than the plants are moving. So I'm, I would bet my whole career that this study will never show a potassium deficiency because the potassium the, the bent grass is getting the potassium it needs from the sand and minerals. Um, so, so long as you continue with that top dressing sand and don't amend the root zone with uh, silicon dioxide or something. Correct. And if, and we did the, the math on this, if we stopped top dressing or if we switched to a top dressing sand that had no potassium in the minerals, um, we think it would still take about 20 years for the, for the uh, potassium in the minerals to be depleted. Yeah, that's, that is fascinating. I, I remember, uh, and I, I can't remember if it was two years ago or eight years ago or five years ago, my memory gets fuzzy, but you had an offer out to study the, this non-exchangeable or mineral potassium or total potassium in top dressing sands. And I think you, you were accepting samples from people. Now, did, did you complete that study and was that published about what the frequency of uh, top dressing sands having enough K to potentially supply all that the grass needs? What could you, I, I just remembered about that and, and I wonder if you could describe that uh, data collection process. Yeah, sure, sure. So, and that's an open offer. Uh, we have a, Is it's it called an X. Still going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you send me okay. your sand, your top dressing sand, um, in a it, dry sand, um, a Ziploc bag, double bag, um, and Micah can put the address in the show notes. I I uh, will. I'll I analyze will. it for free. It it takes uh it takes me almost no time. I'm interested to collect the data where the samples come from. You know, include a note of the of the sand source, the location, the name of the the supplier. Um, and so basically what we found is that, uh, that you find more potassium in the minerals as you travel west across the United States and less as you go to the east. And that matches up perfectly with what we know about soil science is that uh, rainfall precipitation uh, removes potassium minerals. And as you go west, you get drier and drier. So Wisconsin has kind of a, an average amount of potassium in, in the sand sources in the Midwest. Uh, if you move east, the you, you find lower and lower mineral potassium. And as you go west, you can have two or three, uh, maybe even four times more potassium in the minerals than, than what I see in, in my sand. So again, I only know that these results are valid for my exact study. Um, but based on that information, we can hypothesize that if you have a total, if you have a sand with a similar or in, or even higher potassium content, that you probably would see what I would see too for bent grass. I don't know if it's true for annual bluegrass. I analyzed mm -hmm. sand from the Rutgers 
research that found more uh, winter kill and more anthracnose on on annual bluegrass and their sand has much less potassium than mine so you know another question i would have is if you did that annual bluegrass experiment in wisconsin would you see the same results is annual bluegrass able to extract potassium like bentgrass can and those are questions that we don't have answers to yet and nobody knows so when you say that that the conditions of your experiment you're you're talking about bent grass and that type of sand and the end rate what's your nitro annual nitrogen rate you're putting on those plots it's about two pounds per thousand per year which is typical for for wisconsin and my growing season that's um, about 100 kilograms per hectare correct yep 10 10 yep. grams of nitrogen per square meter yes yeah, and so and, if we uh, fertilized at a higher rate, let's say we went out at 200 kilograms per hectare, 20 grams per square meter, or four pounds per thousand, um, we might be increasing the demand for potassium to a point above which the plant can't keep up with extracting from the minerals. Mm -hmm. And then we would see, uh, per perhaps we would see um, potassium deficiency symptoms. So there's a lot of moving parts. And, and like you said, the conditions of the study are important to interpreting the results and it's a it's a beautiful simple study it's uh and you know you've called it boring a number of times but those kind of simple experiments that get repeated i think are uh good for learning and it, you know it's not just like compare five different factors and do treatments for three months this summer three months next summer and then publish a paper and this is more of a long-term type of experiment and then you get more confident with the results. So even though you know that the results are, you're very confident about how it's going to perform at your site and under the conditions of your experiment. But as you get more and more confident and just see year after year after year that the same thing happens, then you can start to extrapolate to, uh, you know, perhaps there's specific soil tests that could identify which sands have a certain amount of potassium that could supply you know like like the boiling nitric acid test or something like that and uh how how are you testing the sands and maybe we'll talk about the destin and uh guillard paper about non-exchangeable k and i think they tested eight different sands and that was just that was shocking and i i've read that a few times over the years and every time i reread it i'm just uh, i'm shocked and I'm shocked again. I'm, I'm perhaps more shocked than the first time I read it. And uh, and I realize, and I learned new things from that particular paper. And yeah, um, it's really good. They got yeah. they got a lot of things right. Um, that paper. When you read that paper, you work in potassium and read that paper, you think, boy, am I am I doing anything new here? Um, yeah, it's, it's like really well, cool. well I, I look back and I'm like, man, what? what was I thinking with my PhD research? Which of course I cited their paper. I think that was published in 2001, maybe. Well, yeah. And and so I was aware of that, but I was still just pushing ahead with my the way I did my experiment, but I should have done a lot more um, boiling nitric acid tests looking at non-exchangeable K. Yeah, and they say, so, I mean, one of the, I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head, but they're basically just like the, the plant, these plants are, the turf is getting potassium from uh these these minerals a non-exchangeable pool in a in a pretty major way and it, de it depends on the type of sand that you have which is like yeah that's that's exactly what we're seeing now 20 years later yeah i, I will put a link to that paper and in in the show notes also and if it's behind a paywall and you want to get it it's very readable and very very interesting for people who are interested so if if the link doesn't allow you to download it just send me an email and i will send it to you so this is a paper by the late william dest and carl guillard and it was published in the i think it was in the international turfgrass society research journal i believe in 2001 and what they did they took I believe they took eight different sands from around the United States. They were doing this research, I believe in, in Connecticut, and they had some sands from Florida, some sands from other places and some local sands. And they tested it for potassium using, I believe, uh, ammonium acetate, which is the standard, uh, standard extractant, Malik-3 
gets a similar it extracts a similar right. amount of potassium and that's called exchangeable potassium and it was really low because it was just sand it was they it wasn't sand with amendments it wasn't sand with organic matter in it where all the cec comes from it was just sand so sand has like ridiculously low potassium it's like eight parts per million three parts per million maybe you know that kind of level which is really low what you know just a fraction of what the mlsn minimum is for an, a root zone that actually has organic matter and cation exchange capacity in it and will have naturally a little bit of potassium and they grew bent grass and um then they compared when potassium was added and potassium wasn't added and they got no response to added potassium in five or six of those out of the eight sands and yet they they were testing like almost almost no potassium it, and right so you read that and may, perhaps you can tell by the tone of my voice or something it's a little bit shocking and then you reread it and you're like man that's shocking and then as you do more and more research in this you're like man this is something that we need to pay attention to because if you look at the quantity of potassium fertilizer that gets applied it's a huge number it's second only to nitrogen i i believe or it should be second only to nitrogen but in a lot of cases at least with bent grass it seems like there's something magical with bent grass at least bent grass and sands where it is able to obtain all it needs without supplemental fertilizer and as you keep showing in your very interesting boring experiment <laughs> when you do add the potassium it can lead to or i mean it does lead to increased snow mold year after year after year Right. Yeah. So you're wasting money uh, and potentially increasing your disease pr pressure. Um, about the, the species uh, specificity, uh, the, the person across the hallway from me, John Jones, who's a research scientist at the University of Wisconsin, working with some, some other folks at Wisconsin, does similar work. Soil test calibration for phosphorus and potassium on corn. Mm -hmm. And I, I sometimes use, when I'm talking about soil testing from turf, I use, hey, this is the basis of soil testing. The reason we started doing this is because we had calibration data in corn and soybeans and things that we've adjusted. And so I was talking to him and he's got these beautiful ye corn yield response curves where when exchangeable potassium is low in Wisconsin soils, corn yield drops off a cliff and, and, and he, can, he has them down to almost zero. And he's doing this research. Yield. That, the like, yield is down to zero or the, po the soil the, potassium? The grain yield goes down to zero at like uh, I don't know, 50 to 70 um, parts per million extractable K, you know. And and then he's, he's telling me about this, this research he's doing. I'm looking at his data and he's got it at like five different sites across Wisconsin. And then he tells me, you know what, though? There's one site where we don't see this, where corn yield does pretty good across all levels of exchangeable K. I said, oh, where's that? Hancock, Wisconsin. Guess what type of soil they have in Hancock? Sandy Sand. soils. That's where they do the, the irrigated corn in, in central Wisconsin. And he's like, yeah, yield's pretty good, even at really low exchangeable soil K. And I said, hmm, sound, sounds familiar. So I do think <laughs> there is evidence out there that you know, if you have a lot of sand size fractions, there's there's potassium minerals in there that corn, likely many it's, plants are are taking advantage of. Yeah. So this. Uh, so just to go back to that top dressing sand collection offer, I'll put the address in. People can send in sands to you. You will test it. Are you testing for total K or are you doing a boiling nitric acid or no, the, yeah, the reason I say it's an open offer, some of your sand doesn't take me long, is I use XRF, X-ray diffraction <clears throat> fluorescence. Oh, right. Sorry, not diffraction, X-ray fluorescence. It's a, it's a literal, it's like from the future, it's like a ray gun. You, you, put this, you put the dry sand sample, you don't even have to take it out of the bag. And I hold this uh, $20,000 gun and I press a button and it tells me the total element concentration for many elements and potassium is one. And it, whatever the number is, half a percent, one percent, three percent, four percent, I I write that down. Wait, is it doing that because it it's figuring out the mineralogy from the angles of the light diffraction or something? 
No, it's not. It's not a mineral. It's not like X-ray diffraction. It's X-ray fluorescence. So it shoots an X-ray, and then the X-ray will send back wavelengths of light depending on which atom it hits. Wow. And, and so it's it's really amazing. It's really it's a common device that they use for testing like le for lead contaminated soils. Um, but it's pretty good at a whole bunch of el total elemental concentrations and potassium wow. is one. So it's easy to me. I don't, it's dry. There's not much sample prep. Um, I wait for like 10 samples to show up and then I go up and I knock them out. So I probably have a database of like 50 to 70 SAM samples um, around the U.S. And so I haven't published those. Maybe I should uh, uh, talk with you about maybe finding a good way to get that information out. Um, but yeah, happy, happy to do it for anybody who sends me a sample. Yeah. It's interesting because I keep, yeah, you know, I, I do soil testing and, and make fertilizer recommendations as one of, one of the many things that I do for work. Um, and so I make fertilizer recommendations for professionally managed turf sometimes based on soil test results. And I have to keep questioning what I'm recommending for potassium, especially when it's like bent grass greens growing in sand, which are pretty common, because your Malik three numbers in your sand is like 20 or 25, right? It's something like that. Uh, even lower. Yeah, most of our non-fertilized ones are in the in the teens. Okay, so so that's really low because the Malik uh, the Malik three extractant for potassium. Uh, if, if you're in the bottom 10% of good performing turf, you're going to be less than 37 parts per million. That's what the MLSN minimum of 37 means. So it means 90% of the good performing turf is grown in soils that's above 37 parts per million. So when you're down at like half of the MLSN minimum, you're, you're going to be at some, it won't, it'll be probably less than the fifth percentile. So it's, it's really low. It's, it's, uh, is about as low as as would be common to measure and yet that is good performing turf in fact it's performing better than the plots that have 25 or 30 parts per million and your sand just doesn't hold very much exchangeable potassium because when you add the potassium so so soil testing is not so useful for that particular sand so maybe we can talk a little bit about uh if somebody's growing rye grass or bermuda grass or bent grass or poa what's a reasonable way to make fertile to decide how much potassium fertilizer to apply and like can we can we make a reasonable recommendation without uh without mentioning tissue testing <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 uh yeah i don't know i mean it, it's it's i think it's part of the problem that practitioners have with this work is that they assume that i'm telling people you know stop fertilizing with potassium I, I don't i don't necessarily think that's a conclusion part part of what we do in science is just try to figure out the way that things work um if i had conditions similar very similar to mine i would have a high degree of confidence that i don't need to apply potassium but if you're in a different situation i think i would just keep that information in the back of my head and uh, kind of what I, what I tell people is like soil testing, if, if your grass looks good, the numbers in your soil are telling you that you can grow healthy grass at those soil levels. So then it would be if, if, the, if they are low, a question of just maintaining those soil levels. Could they go lower? Possibly. Um, you don't win any prizes for getting your soil test levels even lower, but you certainly don't need to chase a number. Um, whether it's MLSN or SLAN or BCSR or anything else, if you're if you are producing high quality turf that's meeting your goals at at whatever soil levels you have, then you can choose to fertilize to maintain those levels, and that usually means replace as much as you remove on an annual basis. And so that that's very good advice. I I agree with that, and that makes sense for every kind of grass, right? Uh, I, yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I think, um, if you don't know, right, if you take over a place and you're not sure if the grass is good performing, that's when those soil testing guidelines can be useful. But if you have experience at a place and 
you you have a record of soil testing like for example you and i have this conversation privately all the time is um, on many of my research putting greens i get high performing turf below mlsn and you say of course that's how mlsn was designed is that there's 10 percent of the samples that we know perform well below those levels um and so you it's almost like a customized threshold level that you can create for your course like for example i know that if my soil phosphorus gets into the single digits i'm likely to see a phosphorus deficiency so then i would know that i need to keep my soil test levels in the in the in the double digits for phosphorus but it, but i don't necessarily need 21 from the mlsn or 25 is what the university of wisconsin tells me i know that as long as it's above single digits i'm good and i know that from tracking the performance of my turf and taking soil samples on a regular basis. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. I want to share how I would do it. And I think we'll, maybe it's similar to what you've said. Um, I like to use the MLSN guidelines as like a floor that we don't want to drop below. Cause I'm, I'm really confident that if we have, we're just talking about potassium, I'm not going to talk about other elements, just, just potassium here. So no matter what grass we're, growing, I'm, I'm pretty confident that if we have a soil potassium level above MLSN, that the MLSN minimum, which right now is 37 parts per million. I mentioned right now because the MLSN guidelines are uh, a work in progress that we intend to continue updating as we have more data. And so the next uh, update will have a slightly lower potassium because of the data that we've collected since then show that the MLSM minimum will be about 30 or 31, which is what happens when I run it, when I run the analysis on the updated data set. But for right now, MLSM minimum is 37. So that's parts per million or milligrams per kilogram on a Malik 3 soil test. So if you're at 70 or 60 or 50, you're going to be fine. And I think that's going to be fine for any kind of grass. But as, as the grass grows and if you harvest clippings or just uh, as grass grows and if you don't apply so much potassium, if you apply less than the grass uses, we expect the soil potassium to go down over time. And so assuming that you soil test on a regular basis, and I mean like annually, then you should notice that it declines if you're applying less than the grass uses. And as you get close to that MLSN floor, then this is where we make a custom or my recommendation is now we make a custom fertilization plan for our site. If we've got bent grass and if the grass is performing well, and if we might have snow mold pressure in the winter, then I'm definitely going to pay attention to not, I'm going to, I'm going to try to avoid applying potassium. That's when I might do some tissue testing, maybe have my top dressing sand checked. Um, just, but I would be pretty comfortable with bent grass with saying, let's just let it keep going down based on what you've seen. But, but I'm aware that that's kind of non-standard, but it could be a huge benefit. Imagine if you have sandy, sandy fairways and you're able to skip snow mold applications, which that right. would be, or save on, um, potassium fertilizer, which is quite expensive. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so not only. Right. I, I was, I was taking another step, but you could just save on the, on the potassium fertilizer. Um, so there are, are potential benefits that you could get by not applying something that causes a problem. Right. So nobody's going to go out like every, for example, you could apply sodium, uh, chloride or something to your grass. Um, and you could expect that if you applied it in the wrong way at the wrong time, you might cause some damage. So no, so you're going to avoid doing that. Right. And the weird thing is potassium is a salt also. So <laughs> the potassium fertilizer forms are always salts, whether that's potassium sulfate or potassium acetate or whatever, it's, it's a salt. And so by applying that, you would be causing a problem also potentially with increased snow mold. So it makes sense to avoid that. And then you could potentially reduce some fungicide applications also. So for bent grass, I'd let it drop down to about MLSN and then start paying more attention. Um, yeah. 
Now, for the other grasses, I will also let it drop down to MLSN. If it's Poa annua, I'm probably at that point going to pay close attention to supplying the grass with all the potassium that it can use. And with other grasses, I'm probably going to pay attention to to supplying the grass with all the potassium it can use also. But what I've been trying to do now is, is add on this extra step, um, which is we've talked about soil testing regularly, soil testing year after year at approximately the same time. And we can look at how much potassium fertilizer has been applied from one soil test event to the other. And then we can do a little bit of math and check what the expected change in soil test potassium was based on how much the grass grew and and we can use our nitrogen rate as an estimate for the upper limit on how much the grass grew and how much potassium should have been depleted from the soil from root uptake and then we know how much was added by fertilizer so based on those numbers we've got soil test at time a soil test at time b and we know the nitrogen rate and from that the expected potassium depletion and we know the potassium added so now you can look at the the change in soil test potassium was it as expected was it more than expected did it go down more than you expected or did it go down less than you expected in the cases where it goes down less than you expected that that means potassium is staying stable in the soil more than you would have expected. So there's potassium being resupplied from somewhere and probably it's coming from mineral sources. But you start looking at things like that and that's what I'm using for some of my clients to try to make more accurate soil testing, uh, not, no, more accurate soil test interpretation and from that more accurate fertilizer recommendations for potassium because um, I, I don't think your site is the only site in the world where you have increased snow mold from adding potassium. You, you definitely, this, this effect has been seen in other places and it's just like potassium defi deficiency is a scary thing so you want to avoid that but you can also cause problems by adding potassium. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And that, that's what my answer is now. That's how I would handle it. So yeah, that's awesome. And I think your your the next step that you just described is, is really smart because if we published a paper that on this experiment, I think in 2018 ish in, in a journal called plant and soil. And, and we sort of did that. We looked at like, uh, how what we expected the malic three to drop to based on nitrogen removal or on <clears throat> potassium removal in the tissue and it was just a tiny fraction of what we expected it to drop to and came to the same conclusion is that it's being resupplied from the minerals and so you could absolutely do that you could you could uh calculate how much it should have gone down based on how much grass you grew and how much fertilizer you applied and if it's not doing that then there's another source and it could be irrigation water which we looked at and we have no potassium no mm -hmm. appreciable potassium in our irrigation water or it could be re being resupplied from the soil minerals um yeah there's only so a couple great. places there's only a couple places it can come from and and it's rare to have irrigation water that's going to have so much potassium that it's going to increase your soil it's super rare and so rare that I, I recently talked to a superintendent um, who showed me his irrigation water just blew me away. I mean, really high potassium in his irrigation water. And he was telling me that he was seeing magnesium deficiency in his turf that was being irrigated with this water. I said, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense because the amount of potassium you're applying through irrigation water is through the roof and the plant will preferentially take up potassium mm -hmm. um, because of its evolutionary history. So yeah, th it's rare, but it's, it's not non-existent. And I think in that case, it might've been a wastewater source that can be high in potassium. Yeah. That's uh... the other thing I wanted to say, Micah, before we move on to the next topic is the um, spatially, when you talked about how you might recommend applying potassium when there's unknowns involved and snow mold is, is involved that you don't want to make worse is just think about it temporally. So 
apply your potassium in the spring, in the summer, and then stop applying midsummer and allow the plant to adjust to, to lower levels. I don't know, I don't have evidence to say that that will be enough to minimize snow mold, um, but it's cert you can certainly think about that. Like if somebody had a, a annual bluegrass, um, creeping bentgrass mixed stand where you're worried about things on different levels, you can think about when you put the potassium down because you, you know that when you apply potassium fertilizer, it shows up increases in the tissue immediately. And then if you stop, you can see declines relatively rapidly in the, in the tissue too. So you can think about what, what potassium has been associated with and then timing your applications to coincide or not apply to coincide with those stresses, I think is a good strategy too. Yeah. It's, it, it, it would seem for any grass, uh, during the summer, applying potassium as fertilizer at the same rate that it's being used by the grass, at the same rate that the grass is growing and harvesting potassium, that seems like a very reasonable thing to do. For creeping bank grass, it seems particularly unreasonable in the autumn when the grass is not growing rapidly and not using much potassium. It seems a particularly poor strategy to add uh, much potassium at all, but certainly adding more potassium than the grass can use in the autumn, uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense for bent grass, no matter what your soil test levels are, really. Um, and for other grasses, it doesn't make much sense either, but uh, there's less evidence that it causes harm <laughs> other than just being silly. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely when you add potassium in, uh, Grady Miller did this with Tiff Dwarf, I think, and found when he added potassium. So now we're talking about Bermuda grass. When you add potassium, it reduced the calcium and the magnesium in the leaves. And with my research, when I added potassium, it reduced the calcium and magnesium in the leaf. And that is no, uh, I don't, I mean, there must be a thousand people that have done the same thing so that's not like that was any groundbreaking research but that's just like that happens and adding nutrients in the rate that is something reasonable and close to what the grass can use just makes sense so i used to i used to be i never want to admit that i i was chasing numbers in the soil chasing soil test results but maybe there was a time i was because i remember that sometimes if potassium got low enough in the soil i'd recommend adding uh nitrogen and potassium in a one to two ratio so but when you do that you're adding four times as much potassium as the grass can use and when you add four times as much potassium as the grass can use the expectation is and the reason why i was making that recommendation was because i wanted it to increase in the soil and i don't make that recommendation anymore so when the soil potassium gets really low i just kind of accept that that soil uh can't hold much potassium and now i just make a recommendation to apply about at the rate that the grass uses because yeah. right and and so yeah, i've right. kind of evolved I, on this and that's yeah that's what we see my when we the, the potting green that i'm doing this research on was was straight sand so no organic amendment has a very low cc and if and to get to the mlsn of 37 parts per million i have to fertilize at about a, a pound per thousand square feet uh, per month or 50 kilograms per hectare, five grams per square meter every month to get to that MLSN level because I don't have enough ex can I exchange sites. And so doing that, um, in this case, we'd be calling out chasing a number, like trying to get to the MLSN is going to give me more snow mold um, where I could, and a grass certainly doesn't use five grams per square meter per month. Um, it's possible that if I applied what the grass needed, I'm going to be below that MLSN number but maybe can get by with decreased snow mold pressure by, by stopping that application of potassium midsummer and allowing the, the plant to have lower potassium levels come winter. Very good. Well, I hope we've given clear enough advice. It's, it's pretty clear to me, but I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, and what you, what you explained sounds pretty clear. I think we, we kind of, are recommending the same thing and uh yeah we're not claiming like that we know exactly what's going on here but 
the pictures don't lie. And uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen that picture before, you got to check it out. And I, I think everybody should know that this is a thing. And uh, yeah, adding, and, and adding... like who should be paying the most attention to this maybe would be like uh, if you're in a place where they golf all year round and you don't grow much grass. And because I think one of the uh, things you hear over and over about potassium is it helps with traffic tolerance. But there's there's only a lit little bit of evidence that suggests that's true. There's one study that shows it, but there's probably 10 studies that haven't made that connection. So if you're in a cool place, you're not growing a lot of grass and you're putting a ton of potassium down because you're worried about traffic, but you also have really high microdochium, that might be a switch that you could, that you could play around with, you know, and I, I don't, I don't advocate people uh, experiment with their golf courses, but give some money to your local, your Oregon state, you know, your Washington state, <laughs> your, your, your people that can do that type of work and uh, mm -hmm. see what they find. Um, but yeah, that's probably what I would advocate for you to do is talk to your local associations, um, spark some, some ideas. Hey, I saw this thing in Wisconsin. I know we're not Wisconsin. We grow different grasses. We have different soils. Can we, if we gave you some money, could you do a, a project like this? And it's, it's pretty simple work to do. Cool. Well, I think I'm about done talking about the potassium topic. Are you about done talking about the potassium topic? For now. For now. For now. Yeah. Um, you got a couple minutes to talk about the pH chart and you, there was that excellent paper from some of your colleagues at the university sure. of Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so everybody, when they, take a introduction to uh, turfgrass nutrition class or an introduction to soil science class or something like that, they probably have come across the chart that shows all the elements as bars and soil pH going from acid of like three all the way across to 11 or 12 or 13 or 14, more basic uh, on the right side. And then those bars change width, right? Based on the supposed availability of the nutrients. Um, I don't think you'll ever have seen a seminar by me that shows that because I have never been a big fan of describing the effect of pH like that. And I was so glad to see that article, which again, if anybody wants it, I think that was also paywalled, but I'll put a link to it. And if you want it, I'll, uh, I'll email it to you or somebody can email it to you. Doug, can you describe the impact of that and why that's such an important uh, and clear and reasonable conclusion? Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, I, I, I'm of two minds of this and you say you don't show it. I do show it. Uh, and I still, I still will show it because it's a valuable chart to introduce the concept of why pH matters uh and it shows it shows a, a variety of nutrients and very simplistic cartoonish uh effects of ph on those nutrient availability to me that's valuable uh to somebody just being introduced to the topic and then i think what what happens a lot of times is oversimplifications lead to, as you go on and into more complex and you go to detailed situations, it leads to errors and mistakes. So I think it's valuable as a, as an introductory to pH and nutrient availability. And then what the paper describes is sort of the, sort of a lack of evidence and the uh, oversimplifications of the things and, on that chart. And I would think there's so, I think, I think the my objection to it is there are so many ex exceptions yeah to what that chart shows to render it meaningless and so I, I would rather rather than suggest that there's any truth to that actually being the case and that nutrients really being relatively available or less available on that particular scale like that um I I would rather explain it in a different way. Now, I, I don't have to teach introductory soil science. And so I just generally talk about, we want to keep our pH between 5.5 and 8.5. And th those are normal levels. And I point out what could happen if the pH is less than 5.5. And I point out what, what having a pH 
above 8.5, we're talking about soil pH, what the pH of above 8.5 would be an indication of, which would be sodium is there somehow, and you've got an alkalinity hazard. And the of course, with a low pH, you have reduced soil microbial activity, which means thatch won't break down as fast, and you have some risk of aluminum toxicity. But of course, if your grass is good, and you've got bent grass, and the pH is 4.6, and you don't have any POA, you might just want to keep it that way. <laughs> but, right. um, you know, there's there's exceptions everywhere. But when you start getting in and start trying to have a distinction between a pH of 5.9 and 6.6 .6 on that particular chart, and people start talking about copper and manganese and, and phosphorus availability changing, and people start trying to hit these target ranges of, and they're constantly trying to adjust their pH. So it's from 6.5 to seven. You look at, look at how many weeds there are in the park grass experiment when they lime it and look at how many and look how many good grasses there are in the unlimed plots and then all you have to do is lime it to five six and seven and you get this explosion of weeds so there's uh there's so many exceptions so i was i was really glad that that paper came out i don't think i put it on my blog yet maybe that would be maybe i'll put that on the on my blog and that's a, a good excuse to have another atc double cut and we could uh show that chart yeah, we could just talk about it's and pH is so plant specific, right? So you'd, you, what you just said is keep your pH between 5.5 .5 and 8.2. Um, there is, there are other crops where that recommendation would be terrible, right? So some crops have specific, they, they need acidic soils. Other crops do very, very poorly in acidic soils. And so the grasses are also, turf grasses are a wide collection. There's, there are differences and in preferences for individual grasses. So how could one chart, and this is my, my argument against BCSR, because of plant uh, specificities and plant genetic differences, how could one soil be ideal? How could a pH of 6.9 be ideal for all plants? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So and then from that perspective, I agree with you completely. And then there's and then, also the, the cover of this book, which shows that uh, photo. This I'm showing a photo of uh, the cover of Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants, the second edition by Horst Marshner. And it shows roots growing in a uh, pH, di pH dye or something. And so you've got a corn plant and soybean plant, and they've they've changed the soil pH in different directions based on the, the specific nutrients that those plants needed to get in that particular soil. And that's the thing that um, even if nutrient um, solubility was as shown in that chart, which that chart is too crude and cartoonish to actually show the detail of what the nutrient solubility is, but plant roots and grasses <laughs> included have the ability to scavenge for nutrients by adjusting the ph in the rhizosphere so so I, i'm just like let's not worry about let's let's worry about something else so i just i i don't really like that chart yeah and it's probably because i do teach intro soils that <clears throat> i have that bias is you're trying to teach a, about soil properties in general and their relevance and at a very high level there's some merit to that chart and helping students understand one of the aspects of pH, which is of course nutrient availability. And I think probably the best, my favorite part of versions of that chart and the one that's in the Brady and Wild, like the, the most famous, most widely used textbook, the most recent edition contains that chart. And the, the, the specific part of it, which is in that paper is where it shows the, the phosphate being like linked up with calcium and aluminum uh, as like a zipper. And I think that's probably the most useful component because that's that's very true. Phosphates are important for plant nutrition. They have very limited solubility that is tightly controlled by pH and they will precipitate with calcium at high pH and they'll precipitate with aluminum at low pH. And that chart does a good job of showing that specific phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> so there are, I mean, but would I ever give that chart to a golf course superintendent and say, this is why you need to have a pH of 6.5? Not a chance because the grass, the grass conditions, uh, the specific grass you're growing, that, that doesn't make any sense to translate or superimpose that chart on top of. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining 
the ATC double cut today, Doug. Um, I, I think we're going to need to talk about that pH one some more, but uh, I think maybe we can prep for that. Maybe we could even do that as an ATC office hour sometime and let people ask some questions um, and, and stump us. Because when you get on the topic of pH and then somebody says, well, what about my centipede grass? Um, you know, it's pH 7.7. Would it be better at 5.9? And uh, you can find the limits of my knowledge pretty quick when you start asking those kind of questions. <laughs> because I don't know that one. So anyway, thanks a lot, Doug. I won't take up any more of your time. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Do you Anything else you want to say, Doug, before we go? No, this has been fun. Happy to do it, Micah. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I'll put all the links to the stuff that we talked about. Um, I'll, I'll get that address from Doug. I'll put links to all those papers that we discussed. And anybody that's interested in these topics, um, can get a lot more information by, um, by, by reading those. So thanks everyone for listening. And, uh, I'll be back again soon with some more interesting turf grass topics for ATC from Yantikau, Thailand. I am Michael Woods. Bye-bye.